So Tommaso De Sonia, it's great to have you on the Ion Yan podcast. Welcome. Thanks, man. It's uh, it's good to be here, Lucky. Very excited. So what we like doing to start off these yarns is you actually sharing um, sharing your favourite quote. Great. Uh, I've got it just here. It's uh, it's from a novel. For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest, Ernest Hemingway. It's a, a great, uh, great book, great read. Uh, something that people can pick up now, uh, a lot of time for reading. So the quote goes like this. Today is only one day in all the days that will ever be. But what will happen in all the other days that ever come can depend on what you do today. Yes, I love that. <laughs> Where did you come across that? Uh, so I was just reading it. Um, I think... Uh, I think actually it was a gift. The, the book itself was a gift. Um, one year, uh, I think maybe Christmas or birthday novel. Um, I can't actually remember who it was that gave it to me now, but read it. Um, and then when I came across that quote while I was reading it, I thought, wow, that's a, that's a really good one. It's a really good one. And in the context of the novel, they're, they're talking about this big, um, op, big mission that they're doing um, uh, during the war, during the, I think it's the set in the Spanish Civil War or something like that. And, uh, but I, I think that when I was reading that, I was thinking, you know, it's really true. It, it is really true that, you know, that, that any, that uh, today is just another day. There's been however many days and the, the billions of years that it's have existed in the universe so far. But it, 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 whilst that's the case, what you can do today, it can shape all the other days that there are to come. So it really gives you that, that, uh, that feeling of, you know, staying in the moment, staying in today. Um, and doing what you can with the time that, that you have to really make a difference for yourself in the future. So kind of, you know, putting, putting things in the bank, uh, so to say, as well for, uh, for your future self. It certainly is a bit of a theme. Um, a lot of the people I've been interviewing kind of had similar kind of messages about it's, mm. it's all the little things um, in time in, that you can do today that makes the impact. You know, it doesn't have that instant gratification and all these different things. One of my favourite, because when back in the back in the heyday, I used to have this big poster up at my end of my bed, and it says um, it was a big picture of Lisa O'Neill. Remember Lisa O'Neill? Is it, was it Lisa O'Neill? Susie O'Neill. Susie O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> Susie O'Neill at the Sydney Olympics. She goes, "When ten thousand hours of preparation meet with one moment of opportunity." And that yeah. was her jumping off the blocks. And it was this beautiful picture of her. And I remember seeing that. And that kind of got me through a lot of those years of training. Did you have any other kind of quotes that kind of got you through your years of training? Um, yeah, there's a few. I, oh, God, I can't remember some of them. I think, um, I think, I can't remember if this is a Seneca quote. I think it might be of uh, one of the Romans as well. There was the one, there's a couple, in fact, I've got. Um, I think the Seneca quote was be. Uh, it's like be ba be brave and strong. Someday this pain will be useful to you. Um, that's nice. a good one because I think that's a good one. And just that idea of you know, especially um, you know, with, with training and all of that, uh, that grind, that daily grind. Um, some days when you're really hurting, those kind of things are are, um, are really good. Um, there's the the famous um, invenium vium quote from Hannibal Barker. Um, who was the great sort of war general for the Carthaginians back in the day. And he had that, um, the, the full, there's a full kind of quote, but basically the, the, the summary of it is in Venium Beam, which, and the, the kind of um, English, the English version is just, um, I'll either find a, I will find a way or make one. Um, so that's, that's another good one uh, that, that I always like. Yeah. Oh, mate, that is my what motivation here with Fasa and Sonia. <laughs> that is fantastic. Well, mate, I, I got a book of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's, you know, you're no short of um, motivation, more so inspiration. It's kind of, you know, your track record to date, you know, how many years of, uh, since you first started swimming, really? When did you first start swimming? Um, well, geez, I mean, I, I first jumped in the water by myself, uh, probably from from the age of about two years old, I was jumping in the pool um, and, and splashing about, uh, at age of two, so yeah, jumping in the pool and, and splashing about, and then, um, you know, started sort of the club stuff around nine, ten years old, that was sort of the, the, the club sort of things and, and racing and stuff, uh, fell in love with, with the racing, uh, competing and, and all of that. Uh, started to get into state champs, sort of junior states at, at about 11, 12, then, you know, nationals at 13, national age stuff for a couple of years and then building towards open nationals at 16, 17, 18 and then, um, yeah, and then first national team at, at 18 in uh, 2009. Wow. And, um, a full sort of 
yeah, a good good eight years there between 2009 and 2016 on the on the Australian swim team, and, and yeah, that was uh, that that was the journey there, and yeah, still still swimming at the moment, but not uh, certainly not at that level anymore. I think it's quite interesting just for a lot of people who don't really get what um, is required to be an Olympic athlete and a national, you know, representative really, let alone Olympic. Um, that journey from that age of when you're 11, first starting with States and those things, you know, you'd be training, you know, you used to be doing four or five sessions a week, yeah? Uh, yeah, so back back then, um, you know, sort of 11, 12 was at least three swim sessions. I think 13, 14 was when I moved up to about five yep. uh, swim sessions a week. And then uh, sort of 16, 17 was six, seven sessions. And then it was when I hit 18, uh, well, I was still 17 technically when I moved, uh, I moved to Canberra to the AIS. That was when I first started the full sort of 10 swimming sessions a week, three gym sessions, you know, dry land, all that kind of stuff. The, the sort of more, more typical 30 hours or so of, uh, of training that, that Olympic athletes do a week. <laughs> wow, 30 hours of training a week. So I'd love to kind of hear your journey, um, you know, and I guess, you know, for people who don't know Tomaso's story, you were successful in getting to the London 2012 Olympics and you were in the and got a bronze medal as well which is just yes, pretty, yeah. pretty ruddy special, mate. And I want to hear a bit more about that specific experience. But, you know, there's a fair few years of grinding when you were like, you finished school, Christchurch Grammar School, captain of swimming, school prefect, but also you were, weren't just a school prefect, you also got a serious, um, you know, uh, end, of, end of year TE result, yeah? You got, what was your score? Oh, <laughs> The old, uh, I was fortunate enough to be a part of the, the 99 club, as they call it, yeah. Just yeah. scraped in. Uh, I got a, a 99 in. flat on, uh, on, on my ATAR. So That's top 1% uh, yeah. of the state, which is pretty good. Um, and then that kind of really set you up to, you know, be able to get in, do anything you wanted. Was it always because uh, medicine or was it law? Was it anything else? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it had been medicine, I suppose, for... Really, really the whole way. I suppose that was the, the consistent one. Um, you know, I'd been exposed to it from a relatively young age. My dad, um, obviously being a very successful paediatric cardiologist, um, I, I'd seen, you know, uh, his, his life and, and that sort of inspired me as well in terms of his profession. I kind of knew what medicine was about, um, even from a relatively young age. So, and, and it, it attracted me then um, and it still obviously attracts uh, attracts me now and, and now that I'm in my, my final year of study um, but um, yeah it, you know it's different things popped in and out um, I enjoyed uh, you know I, I enjoyed um, law and, and that uh, when I did a bit of mock trials in, in year 12 year 11 and 12 back in high school and uh, all those sorts of things you know science has always been something that I've really enjoyed um, and, I, and I think medicine just really I guess fit the bill um, as I say, it was, it was, it's kind of always just been there and I've never really been able to picture myself doing anything else um, with my time. You know, when I, when I try and picture myself in five, 10 years, I just can't really see myself doing anything else. Can't see myself being anything else than, than, than a doctor, you know, working in hospitals and, and doing all those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's just, uh, I've been fortunate in that way that, that it's just, um, yeah, it, it's just kind of been there. It's always been the goal. And then what the other, the little itch that you had before you become a full-time doctor is just uh, what, go to the Olympics, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, apparently I was 10 when I told my auntie that I was going to go to the Olympics. She, she certainly didn't believe me at the time, but um, managed to prove her wrong. Uh, but uh, yeah, because that was in 2000, I think, just after the Sydney uh, Olympics um, when I so I think I would have been I would have been about nine then nearly turning ten uh, seeing Sydney seeing seeing the big dogs seeing the boys our uh, uh, our coach from Christchurch Bill Kirby up there winning a, a gold medal and all that back in Sydney in two thousand uh, seeing all of that you know that that was a real I suppose inspiring um, time for me and then also having the World Championships back here in Perth back in nineteen ninety eight um, you know seeing the likes of uh, Michael Klim. Um, you know, winning a bunch of medals. That was the competition where Ian Thorpe had his breakthrough as well. 
um, you know, getting to see that firsthand, you know, be there in the stands as a, as a seven-year-old um, watching these, these swimming events and stuff, he, even then was really starting to sort of kindle the fire for, uh, for a, a professional career in, in swimming as well. Well, I really like hearing that because, um, you know, I forgot about that, but I do also remember going there as well. I probably had the same thoughts as well. But um, in 98 and then 2000 for sure. So do you think like now, you know, you're on the board of Swimming WA, um, do you see like actually hosting these events in the state, in the towns is really something to build up cap talent? Are these kind of like, do you think they're fundamental things that are needed? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, I know that from my experience, at least, the, or, or what the evidence seems to suggest is, um, you know, that, that there's very little, um, there seems to be very little link between um, sort of that grassroots participation and sort of the elite level success. Um, but whilst the evidence shows that anecdotally, I just, I don't feel like that's the, that's the case. You know, I think it really does make a difference to people, particularly young athletes, um, you know, pursuing their dreams. Uh, I think that's, that's really where that, that success comes from. I think you're not going to get that level of um, sort of elite success, that sort of Olympics, Olympic medalist, world championships, world championship medalist. I, I don't think you're going to get that. And that, unless that stuff is really in your face, um, and, and, you know, people can see it and, and um, you know, just, just to help them, help people believe that it can happen. Um, you mm -hmm. know, it's something that I like to talk about when I give talks to swimming clubs or, you know, when I discuss things that look, you know, I'm a guy from Perth, um, you know, grew up down the road from you guys, you know, went to school at, at Christchurch where a lot of people, you know, a lot of kids have gone to school before. You, you don't have to be, you know, the kid from, you um, you know, eastern suburbs of Sydney or, or sort of inner Melbourne or something like that to be a sports superstar. You know, you can, you can come from, you can come from Perth, you can come from wherever. And, you know, um, Carl Chalmers is doing the same thing. You know, you, you don't have to be in one of these big eastern state cities. You can be in Adelaide, you can be wherever, you know, as long as you, you've got the passion, you've got the drive, um, you, you'll make it work. And I think having events in, in places as well just adds to that, really adds that fuel, adds that realisation for people too that, that they can pursue those dreams. So it was really unfortunate this year that we were going to have the, the National Age Championships and the Open National Championships here in Perth, which unfortunately were cancelled because of the, the current um, uh, coronavirus crisis. So we were really looking forward to that uh, for, for Swimming WA as a real boon, um, not only to our, our membership and to our uh, future champions, um, but just to be able to host those events and, and really showcase what, what Perth's got. So is that going to be a national Olympic selection as well? So it wasn't going to be the trials. It was just going to be the, uh, the National Open Championships. So they've decided now to kind of uh, push the selection meet for the benchmark meets a bit closer to the uh, meets. It's more following a bit more of a, a US model um, in that regard, uh, which I think has been a really, a really positive move i think that's sort of the way to go i think ultimately you've, you've got to look at what the best in the world are doing if you want to be be the best or, or in fact better than the best um and they've shown time and time again that they are so i think uh, the move towards that is is certainly um a good move so to have these separate competitions now i think is great too because it still gives a really uh you know uh, good opportunity for people to showcase their their work and uh, and their talent on a national stage as well i think the more big events we can have um, in Australia with, with swimming, the better off our swimmers are going to be. So you've also touched on some ideas. Like I think, you know, there is obviously you have these different events and things like this, but then there's one, you know, the parents supporting you as an athlete to do it, but then also the community around you really supporting you to be the best you can be. So you mentioned Bill Kirby. He was the, your swimming coach at school. Obviously, you also had a great swimming coach at West Coast, yeah? yeah. So those, were they some two big mentors for you? Or? Yeah, for sure. You know, I've had some fantastic coaches over my years. You know, um, Graham Williams, Mel Tantrum, Grant Stollwinder. Um, they were really critical for my early development um, as, a, a, as a sort of budding um, champion. Same with Bill um, as well to kind of help provide that, that inspiration and leadership. Um, but really, a, a lot of it came from some of the guys that I had that I was swimming with too. So I was incredibly fortunate to be training with um, uh, current Olympians uh, back, in, back in the day. So, you know, 2004 Olympians, guys like Adam Lucas, um, who was a huge inspiration to me and a, a real leader. He was also the club captain at the time. So really took on that leadership role. But then, um, you know, a lot of the older guys that I had there as well, you know, I had Jim Piper, I had Eamon Sullivan, um, you know, guys that you can look up to and go, oh, wow, you know, that's, that's what it is. 
that's what it takes. You know, that's the next level. You know, seeing mm. really seeing that that next level um, right in front of you helps helps just develop you professionally. Um, just just to help see what you have to do. You know, see what it takes. I guess. So with that, like there's this real idea around like in elite sport, I was having a conversation with one of the AS uh, kayaking coaches the other day and it was, you know, it's interesting. It was that cohort. We had a real high performing squad um, and everyone kind of did do their bit. But I'd love to hear kind of your perspective on, you know, what kind of were the things that made that group so unique? Like, I don't know how, when was last time so many West Australians were in the Olympic team. You know, was it, Yeah. what What kind of was the successful formula for that? Yeah, I think it was, um, you know, these, these things tend to come in cycles. I think once you have, once you have that little bit of success, um, you know, it was started, it was certainly driven at the time by quite a few members there. You know, there were guys, um, guys like Travis Nederpelt that were, were also there, you know, uh, yeah, Olympic level athletes as well. Um, you know, we had Lara Carroll, Jen Riley, um, you know, we had uh, uh, obviously Todd Pearson was still around in that area, at that era as well, um, racing and, and kind of all of that. So, I mean, it really obviously it started with guys like Bill and Todd back in uh, 2000 being a part of that, um, you know, that gold medal winning relay. I, I think that that ultimately kind of really pushed the that sort of next level. I think that's that evidence that you can kind of get at. Look, it's anecdotal, but it's it's there in the sense of you know 2000. You have two guys. Um, that are part of a, a four by two hundred gold medal Olympic gold medal winning relay, and then over the next few years, between sort of two thousand three to two thousand and eight, you have uh, I think about six or seven West Australians um, on the on the national team at at, at any point in time, um, and and it was really it was a really high performing environment. And then in two thousand and eight, you obviously have um, you know Eamon Sullivan breaking world records and winning individual um, medals um, at at, uh, at the Olympic Games in in Beijing. Um, so, you know, and um, yeah, so it's it's really it's all of those things I think coming together, and and that's that kind of that progression that you see. You know, you've got great success, you build on that big group, and then bang, you get a good kind of hit with a a real superstar coming through, mm. um, performing really well. Mm. Um, so I think it, it's really that sort of formula, and you know? I think that's really what it comes down to. And then and then guys like Eamon obviously then helping to to promote then the next um, generation. So you know, hoping to see over the next few years, um, a, a bit of that developing through as well. So, and with that, like, I think the next thing is like, the reality is swimming. It comes down to you in the pool. You may be in a four by two, four by one, all this and that, but the reality is it's you stepping up and doing the best and the fastest swim you can do. So, you know, and, and with that in mind, like, you know, putting in 30 hours, of, of training every week, week after week. I remember over Christmas periods, times, you know, Christmas day, you'd be going for a swim, cheeky swim, probably before and a bit, some sort of light activity in the afternoon on Christmas day to kind of keep that conditioning and keeping that peak performance and the prep for nationals and in the, the world championship teams and all that. So, you know, I guess it's kind of second to your quote that you mentioned earlier, but, you know, is it just, um, you know, for young people who are kind of like on this tipping point who may be listening in now, it's like, like, you know, how is, is it, is it respect? Because there's a bunch of different ways. Respect, is it, res do you just have complete unwavering faith in your coach and just following the program? You get the work done, you'll get the results. Is that kind of the way how you did it? Or is it kind of, and then is it, is it at a certain point where you need to start being a bit more intuitive in yourself and going, I like that what he's saying, but I don't like that. I'm going to shift this, this, that, and the other. Because I think that's like a double-edged sword. If you're young, going hard, you just head down, bum up, get the work done, do what the coach does. But then you get a little bit older, a little bit wiser, and you start picking and choosing what works for you. Is that, was, is that kind of the case for you? Or? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's, um, I think like you say, I think age really, age and experience kind of fall into that a little bit. So you, you kind of, I think when, when you're a bit younger, it is a little bit more of a, a sort of, you know, just do what you need to do, you know, do the work, listen to the coach at that time. They're the one with the experience. They know how things kind of work. Um, and you're still trying to find your feet, um, you know, and one, one way to do that is, is to sort of just experience things, you know, to work hard, you know, work your ass off kind of thing and, and see how you go with that. Um, see how you go with the work but the important thing is to then reevaluate. so you need to be looking critically at what you're doing um, obviously when you're younger you don't have the experience to be able to go 
um, you know, oh, well, this worked, this worked, this didn't until you're a bit older. But um, that's the points in time where you really need to be developing, I guess, that strategy and kind of understanding what, what works for me. You know, what, what do I... What, what, am I, what am I responding well to? What do I enjoy? You know, what kind of sets do I actually like doing? You know, what, what kind of ways do I enjoy punishing myself? Because, um, you know, not everyone's going to be the same. And, and ultimately, you need to be able to work hard. I mean, everyone can just say, oh, well, I, I like when I've got the easy sessions, but ultimately, you're not going to get anywhere doing that. Um, so it's more about, all, you know, finding, finding those things that work, finding, finding the training that works. Um, you know, I've, I had a lot of, uh, I, I went through a few changes over my sort of more professional career in those eight years on the swim team. Initially started um, with John Fowley at the AIS. Um, and that was certainly a, a, you know, a very like hard work program, um, more, I guess, directed, um, more directed by the coach. Then I moved to Tracy Menzies, which became a bit more collaborative, um, a bit more flexibility there. Um, as I was a bit older, I'd been, um, you know, been on a few teams, was starting to kind of develop um, myself as a, as a professional athlete in that way. Um, and then towards the end of my career, um, moving to, you know, moving to uh, Simon Cusack as well, who had a different sort of approach and an approach that I suppose I found I was um, uh, feeling would, would work well for me. So then, you know, kind of changing coach on, on the context of look, someone's doing that over there that looks like what I want to do. Um, so falling then into that program. And then finally, towards the very end of my career with Ashley Callis, who was, uh, you know, another 2000 Sydney Olympic gold medal winning, co uh, gold medal, gold medal winning swimmer um, and great coach as well. And again, moving to that very collaborative sort of, well, look, this is, this is how I, I think this will work. Um, and then a, a, a much more, um, much more of a partnership there. And that sort of last phase when I was a, quite a bit older, um, you know, I'm going to say quite a bit older, but ultimately I was what, 25, I think at the, at the time. So it's not even that, that old really, when you think about it, but you know, on my eight, eight years, of being a, a member of the Australian swim team so when you look at it in that context certainly um, a, a lot more experience there and then that worked you know really well as well um, so I, I had great success with all four um, of those coaches over, over the course of my career um, in, in various ways so they all work um, but just in different ways um, and I think that's that's the challenge ultimately and and you know that's where things like this kind these kinds of conversations help um, you know looking at other people what they're doing kind of trying to gather a bit more information about yourself and the kind of athlete that you are um, and the kind of things that work well for you because obviously the, there's no one formula you know there's obviously even at the AS there's this mentality of like the, the kind of silver bullet you know it's all about you know this training way this 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 is the thing this is the thing you know everyone's looking for that the thing you know the thing that makes the olympic gold medalist the thing that makes the champion you know it's always like this is just one thing and it just isn't it's not one thing it's a whole host of different things and it's always different for everybody um you know if, if i tried to train like you know eamon sullivan i wouldn't have i wouldn't have been as successful as i was if i was doing the exact same thing that eamon was doing if i was doing you know, tried to do what Michael Phelps did in, in between um, 2004 and 2008, where he was in the water every single day for four years um, and, and training like that, I, I, I would have burnt out. I just don't have the capacity to kind of do that level of, 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 uh, of training physically. I just, I know that I would, um, I would have just shut down. My body wouldn't have been able to cope. You know, I would have had problems with injury and all kinds of things, um, not to mention the, the mental side of it too. But that worked for him, you know, that was his thing. And that was his motivator too, you know, he talks about it in his book about how doing that training every day gave him six months work, work more training than everybody else, you know. So it's so variable, you know, it's, it's, you can't sort of make, you can't make a champion. There's no formula for it. It's, it's really a, a host of different factors. And it's, it's really about finding um, what works, what works for you. You know, forming your own path, I suppose, is the best way to say it. Forging um, your own path. Totally, totally. And I guess that that journey to as becoming more of a mature athlete, that builds more self-awareness and then you can do these different things. And that's why over the years we've always been able to, you know, it's been great being able to talk to you about this because you can really, um, you know, it's a journey of self-awareness comes through consistent and ongoing reflection. 
And mm. um, I think as an elite athlete, you've got to continually do that. But also, if you want to be, you know, grow personally in all areas of life, if that may even be in your relationship, um, family, friends, and all these different things, it's that continual journey. And it is quite a stoic philosophy and you quoted some stoic philosophers, philosophers <laughs> earlier so it's quite fitting yeah. for all those non-swimmers and elite athletes how is this um you know i guess sport and and really focusing in on on your craft and that translated into you know quite uh, performing high in other areas of life so for, for, for give everyone a bit of example you've gone post-grad you did undergrad science um, yeah. while you're in the AS8 Australian teams and then you've gone straight into full-time post-grade medicine and you're at the back end of the last year now yeah yep yeah so final year of medicine at the moment um, you know things things are uh, things are obviously changing every week with the, the current climate um, but you know progressing well now it's been a it's been a new challenge Totally. So, but with this mentality, so do you feel, um, you know, with this stress, a lot of people are feeling quite unsure about the future, um, you know, and there's quite a lot of pain in society, like a lot of people are out of work. Um, a lot of people are, you know, feeling a lot of the anxiety and stress and things like that. And you're just, uh, you know, not just up, but you're just, you know, you're t coming 29, coming 30 and you're almost finishing your medicine degree. And I guess how are you managing kind of, who knows what the world's going to be like in six months? Time? Maybe we don't need doctors. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, you know, how have, have you felt, um, you know, uh, what have you kind of been doing to kind of keep a bit calm in this kind of chaotic kind of period? Yeah, look, it's it's interesting. Um, I, I guess I'm in an interesting situation because I have obviously on, on one side of me, I've got medicine. So I've got quite a secure kind of uh, profession, you know, particularly given the current climate. Um, there's not there's not certainly not going to be an issue in terms of um, uh, too many doctors um, or anything like that. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to obviously uh, uh, my, my job prospects are actually better given the current environment. I may actually get graduated early and, and start working earlier than, than what I would normally. Um, but then on the other side, obviously being, being on the board of, um, of Swimming WA, of, of a sporting organisation that obviously relies heavily on members and pools being open and all that kind of side. I see all the, the damage and the effect that, that can occur um, on that side as well. And, and swimming is certainly something I'm incredibly passionate about, um, you know, swimmers and, and all of that and sport in general as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it really is a challenge. And, you know, I, I think I tried, um, I recently set, uh, sent out like an open letter to the swimmers, which I think, uh, um, uh, which was quite well received and uh, also kind of adds to not just the swimmers, but to other sporting people, but then also people in general. Um, about, you know, it's really time to try and, I suppose, innovate um, and, and sort of reinvent yourself and, and really um, take the challenge head on and use it as an opportunity to grow um, rather than rather than kind of um, receding and, and, and just kind of, um, you know, letting yourself um, uh, kind of um, drift away uh, and get lost in sort of the, the unsurety and the confusion and that. Um, but I think one of the other things that, that I think swimming has really given me over the years is, is that experience in, in obviously in elite performance and but also pursuing dreams and goals um, and, and one of those critical features is is like we've discussed before um, uh, and when it comes to like sports psychology and competing and racing and all that kind of stuff which again is a very similar environment you know it's, it's you're not you're not sure of it um, you know you get thrust into a pool you've never raced in before in a foreign country where you don't speak the language like lots of things can come that kind of similar vein of sort of um, uh, insecurity and being unsure about the environment can, can occur um, I'm certainly not saying it's, a, it's the same level but you know just the, there's there are some analogies there um, and the important thing that we always talk about is really staying in control of what you can control and not worrying about things that are out of your control. Um, so I, I use another quote that I used a lot is one that we heard from Auburn University, which is, um, ain't no use worrying about things that are out of your control. Because if they're out of, out of your control, ain't no use worrying. Ain't no use worrying about things that are in your control. Because if they're in your control, ain't no use worrying. So pretty good quote there was it really basically says, you know, if it's in your control, just it's in your control. So don't stress about it. Just control it. Do what you need to do. And if it's out of your control, then it's out of your control. Why worry about it? You know, you can't, you can't control the weather. There's no worry. There's no point worrying about whether it's going to rain tomorrow. You just pack an umbrella. That's, that's all you do. Um, so that, that kind of thing. And I think that's particularly in times of crisis, that's where 
that those kinds of quotes, that kind of mentality, that kind of thinking really comes into play. You know, that's, that's going to separate people from being successful um, off the back of this um, and, and not being so successful um, and, and sort of suffering a lot from it is really allowing themselves to get too caught up in, in the out of the control. Um, as opposed to um, allowing themselves to just focus on what they can do and what they can control in this current environment. Um, the people that do that the best will, will come out the best for sure. Totally, I love that. And it's, it's quite like a simple, what is in control? Like write it down maybe. What is, can I do t- today in this hour, in this moment um, that, can, you know, that I'm in control of and what is out of my control? And actually yeah. that process of writing it down. Otherwise, I think if you kind of, kind of play a big tennis ball in your head around control, not control in your head, ends up being a bit of a grey area whether something is in control which actually isn't mm. in control. But I think actually that process of writing down, I really like that one. It's such a simple way, like KISS model, keep it simple, stupid, just <laughs> exactly, it's yeah. super simple. So, mate, towards the back end, let's have a – you did a bit of an eye on check-in recently. Do you mind sharing your yeah, yeah. last check-in? Yep. Uh, let's see. So you, uh, while yourself. you're opening that up, um, I might just mention about the. Um, so you also attended the um, the most recent or the the North Cod event um, where we had our first suicide prevention day. We did a bit of a celebrate, oh, like celebration, a bit of a World Mental Health Day event at the Surf Club. And since you are a member down there, you attended and you know said a few words and uh, you know and obviously here is your most recent uh, I am young. you'll be able to see this on the YouTube if you're listening in um, yeah. but do you mind just running through you've uh, created a, a March I am, yeah 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 so I was thinking um, I suppose of ways in which something like this could be ways in which people could could really um, get the most out of uh, th- this sort of feature you know ways in which people could really um, you know I guess use use uh, iron effectively and and incorporate it into their daily lives so i've i've kind of created this sort of month um wheel where i've kind of looked back reflected on on march and gone well, what are some of the things that, that that i think you know went so some of the things that were really important to me over that month um and how would i rate some of those things so you know as we've got here um generally you know health i've, I've put rather high um, you know, 8.2, I think I did a pretty good job of taking care of myself. I didn't get sick, didn't get injured or anything like that. Um, so giving myself a, a, a good, uh, a pretty good mark there. I'm certainly not someone that, that'll give myself 10 on anything. Um, it, you know, nine and a half will probably be about as good as it'll get. Um, there's always room for improvement. As, um, uh, as another quote goes, you know, that, that perfection is an endless pursuit. Um, so I won't, certainly won't be giving myself 10s on anything. Um, generally, again, you know, happiness is it's about an eight. Um, you know, again, and probably some areas I could do do better in just to kind of keep my mood up uh, as well, but generally really happy. Um, I put only only about a fire for family. I think I did a pretty poor job in March of kind of keeping in touch um, with some of my more extended family. Uh, but that's something that I've, I've actually um, addressed even in just in April. So I think that's where this, these sorts of things can really help where you go, you know, how was I then? What's my plan now? You know, what can I do now with this coming month to try and help expand some of these lower marked zones um, uh, and look forward to? So, for example, with the, the five and the family, that made me kind of reevaluate. And then just over the last weekend, I made sure I checked in with sort of my grandmother, my cousins, all that kind of stuff as well um, to, to really kind of, um, you know, cue me in to, to, to um, follow up with those important areas. I really um, like that, how you've kind of used this as more, all right, let's just do a overall evaluation of March and just keep that there. Mm. And then maybe, because it's different ways people can have a consistent, because um, maybe priorities in each month could shift and that's mm. okay. You can do it however you want. I don't necessarily need to go into each individual one, why, what, how, but, you know, maybe is there any one, uh, maybe two that you'd like to maybe expand on? Um, you know, I do notice that there are some that are lower than others. Yep. Yeah, so one of the one of the things I've been wanting to do more of is um, uh, meditation. I was doing a pretty good job of, of that towards the end of last year, um, and then over the holidays, kind of let that go a bit, and then um, haven't quite found my rhythm again with that. So that's why mindfulness is a bit is a bit lower. Um, usually, I like to be a bit more regular with my meditation and try and practice that every day. Um, so that's certainly an area when when you when you get that sort of instant feedback and you have a bit of a look and you go, you know, I've rated that pretty low. Um, it gives me a nice snapshot to go, oh, that, that is something I need to pick up on um, and improve on. Um, you know, same with my sleep. 
pretty average. I think I can do a better job of just um, getting my sleep pattern quite in, in trained as well. Um, and yeah, those sorts of things. Um, yeah. So, you know, you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of the way that I've, I've set this, this particular wheel up is um, almost a bit of a, a, like a reflective piece um, over the last, uh, last few weeks. And now that we're leading into a new month, um, I can, uh, I can start a bit of an April wheel and, and just kind of update that as I go um, as well, just looking on, looking on some of those areas. And then by the end of April, be able to reflect on, you know, sort of how, how that's improved. And then um, depending whether or not, it may not necessarily be the exact same um, points, but there will be um, some crossover and then I'll be able to sort of compare those and, and see areas where I can improve. Right. Well, what we're looking at doing, um, thanks for sharing that. And a big part of, you know, doing iron is about being, you know, a bit vulnerable. And I do see you put, you know, right, it, you know, mindfulness is quite low. And, you know, a lot of people in this time are feeling quite, um, you know, vulnerable. I guess yourself, you've got a lot of resilience in there. But you know, obviously it is quite, you know, it's going to put the swimming WA back a little bit with these pools being closed and things like that. Um, great. Well, I love it. And so do you see this with your medical kind of background as being a useful tool you know as part of um you know a patient care system or something like that like obviously you're one of the most the freshest waves of medical students coming through you know where do you find this process of reflection um is powerful for you know i remember being in the bed and saying give me a score out of 10 for pain or give me a score you know these kind of things you get those assessments but you know could you see that something like this could be useful in some of those cases yeah, for sure. I mean, there's there's such a variety of things that you could use uh, something like this for these kind of reflection tools. I mean, not just for patients, obviously for doctors as well. It's it's hugely important, and self reflection is is sort of a necessary part of uh, professional development as well. And like I was saying, you know, very much like we were doing in in swimming, and very very much like when you're you know trying to pursue. Uh, I guess a professional career in in competitive sport. The same goes with any kind of high intensity profession, where you need to be reflecting on your own practice in order to be better. Um, and that's sort of what the what what the goal would be there. So certainly, a, as a, as a doctor, um, something like this could be incredibly helpful. Um, it can be incredibly good um, for teams working in an environment as well. Um, so doctors in teams. Um, putting together sort of team IRs and checking in with each other as well, seeing how the group is performing. Um, but then exactly like you say, from a patient perspective as well, gives a great insight into um, uh, how a patient is traveling. Um, you know, what sort of potential things that, that you could fill a wheel with can be anything from, like you say, from sort of pain scores and general well-being. Um, you can also give them um, goals to achieve in terms of like rehabilitation goals too. So, you know, older patients or, or patients coming out of surgery, you might want to put things like, um, you know, rehabilitation and exercise might be key features. Um, you know, for people that have more uh, lifestyle-based goals as well. Um, you know, if they have trouble with um, sort of, you know, metabolic syndromes and things, there's certainly ways that, uh, that those kind of things improve. Um, sleep, we know, is, is crucial for many, many things. Um, it's highly interlinked with both physiological and psychological well-being. Um, and that's one of the core facets of the, of the wheel as well that you can, um, you can monitor on, on a, um, anywhere from a daily to a, a weekly basis as well. Um, and because of the sort of intuitive nature of the app uh, and the wheel, it really does, exactly like you said before, give a real snapshot um, in terms of just quickly being able to assess um, how people are traveling in, in those sort of uh, areas as well. So, yeah, it's um, you know a, a very um, flexible tool uh, and, and certainly can be used in a variety of ways, uh, for anywhere from, you know, like I say, doctor and doctor group well-being, patient well-being, um, you know, for athletes, athlete well-being and, and future development um, or even just personal um, development as well. So it um, doesn't always have to be professional development like, like I've set up my sort of march wheel, um, just more of a, a personal reflection tool to go, well, what are some of the core things that I'd like to improve on, you know, this month, this coming month or these coming weeks and, and how can I bring those numbers up? Mate, I really appreciate that. Thanks for the plug, mate. It's good to hear that it's aligned. <laughs> no worries. So I guess, you know, just before we wrap up, um, I'd love to just hear, you know, what's one really exciting thing you're looking forward to uh, for over the April period in this kind of dark period? What is it kind of a bit of a something you're looking forward to? Um, oh, look, I mean, obviously everything, with everything happening at the moment, um, really just, I suppose, what's happening in the, in the medical world at the moment. Um, there's obviously some exciting things for us, potentially students, to be able to 
um, step up and and start um, you know working and, and helping the the current um, workforce with with everything that's going on. Um, so I mean I'm I'm really looking forward to hopefully getting getting out there and um, uh, you know having having an impact and starting to put. Uh, this sort of three and a half years of, um, of uh, intensive medical education uh, to the benefit of, of patients and to um, help ease the, the load in terms of staff and uh, workers that we have currently working in hospitals. So that's, that would be really, really be the main thing. And then when this is all over, um, getting back into the pool and, and having a bit of a swim, I'll certainly be looking forward to something like that. And then uh, I'm sure somewhere in the mix is also meeting up with your beautiful fiance, who you've <laughs> been stuck and doing long distance. She's in stuck in yes. Queensland at the moment, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, she is still working hard um, teaching year threes uh, in in Queensland. So unfortunately, with all the restrictions at the moment, can't see her. Um, so I, I'm, I doubt that that's going to be able to um, uh, change over the course of April. But certainly later in the year, um, you know, uh, looking forward to, to sort of um, uh, getting back together with Chanel uh, and spending some time with her. But um, yes, that's, that's another challenge that, that I'm having to deal with at the moment. Totally, mate. Well, Tommaso, thank you so much for joining us on the I Own Yarn podcast. It's been, uh, you know, so it's always been a gold mine to get you on here and have a bit of a yarn. We've <laughs> had many unrecorded yarns over the years, but um, really appreciate it. And obviously, um, very excited for you in this month ahead and so appreciative that as a fellow sand groper that you're still there giving back <laughs> to the community through swimming wa and and all these different platforms that you contribute your time and energy towards so if people do want to follow you after this where can people find you uh easiest is probably uh instagram at tomaso door um it's also linked to my twitter which i'll i tweet every now and again um same tag at tomaso door um, is it D-D, -D yeah, sorry, spell it out. <laughs> uh, T-O-M-M-A-S-O-D-O-R, just all one word, Tommaso Dor. Uh, and then Facebook as well, I've got a, um, I've got a page there, um, which you can, uh, you can follow me on where all that sort of stuff gets updated as, uh, as well. Fantastic. 